put up the first slide and, and we'll just take them through it? Yeah, I think they have to assume that we read the book. Okay, yes. <laughs> you want to add anything to what I said about the, about the prologue? Uh, no, not at all. But I do just want to say that Mick, I did get a hold of him. We were talking up to about 159. He was trying to get logged on. Technical difficulties just couldn't make it. So he's hoping to be present for the next one. And just so everybody is aware, there are the 142 sites for the book. And um, we are going to show about 13 of them today, um, really just focusing on the greater Estes Park region. And we just kind of pulled some of our favorites that have some fun stories. So we'll be talking about the historic context of them and also how we got the photographs and why we're using some of those photographs. Um, here's just some basic information about uh, the book itself. Um, and you know the price for it, $59.95. They're shipping it anywhere uh, that, that people are for $10. And within our 80517 zip code, uh, you can actually uh, get it delivered if you'd prefer that. So you can purchase it online and we provide the website there. And also our members receive 10% discount. And if you do become a new member, just for that 10% discount on this book, you do get one of those masks. So I had to force my family into modeling the masks in that little picture down there below. So thanks to them. Um, and also the most important thing I think about this book, as much as we like everybody enjoying it, is the proceeds of the book are actually going towards a, a new collections and research facility and upgrades to the museum annex to become that professional facility that we need. Um, like Jim was saying, we relied so much on historic images for this. Um, we thought it would be appropriate for the money that we raised to go towards preservation. Okay. So we're gonna dive in with the first site. And when I call it site five, even though this is the first one we're showing, I'm, I'm uh, aligning it to the sites that we had in the book itself. So in the book, this is site five, and it's the Estes Evans Dunraven Ranch. And, this, is where, uh, this is where it all began. You all know the, the story. In October of 1859, Joel Estes and one of his sons stood at the top of Park Hill and looked down in this, into this pristine and empty valley uh, they thought they were in North Park. It was the only park they, they knew about in Colorado. Uh, they'd come up from Fort Lupton on the Platte where they'd been raising cattle. Uh, they came back on a, a hunting trip and on that October day, they became the, uh, the first known Anglos to look down on, the, on this valley. Obviously, Estes Park had been occupied by Native Americans for thousands of years. Uh, they found sound signs of wiki-ups and other Indian activity, but we now know that the Native Americans, probably the Ute and the Arapaho, uh, left the area as, as a tribal presence probably about 1850, about uh, 10 years before the Estes arrived. So they moved down into the, to the valley, uh, established a, a, a ranch of sorts, obviously very crude at the beginning, uh, some rough log cabins and some outbuildings, and for several years tried to make a living of it here, raising, raising cattle. Eventually, it, they simply decided they couldn't make enough money with the size of herd of cattle they were raising. They needed to increase the size of the herd, and so they left, they left Estes Park. And then into, the, into their cabins comes this Welshman, this fellow Griff Evans that uh, Isabella Bird writes so much about in her Lady's Life in the Rocky Mountains. So she moves into the uh, Estes cabins. Uh, they, uh, they begin, he, be, he begins then to enlarge the place into a, a much larger ranch. Uh, he soon is taking in guests and tourists and becomes in effect, in effect the, um, uh, the first uh, entrepreneurial uh, vacation host in the Estes Valley. And this is the uh, way his ranch, ranch operation looked probably about 1899. Uh, it's taken from up on the side of the hill uh, above what is today the lower arm of Lake Estes. And of course, th today, if you were looking down from this site, you would see the Estes Park schools on the, on the opposing side of the road. Uh, Derek, what have I missed? Um, I don't think a lot. Um, I, I'll jump forward to the photo, but realize, and I'm, I'm not sure if everybody can see my mouse or not. Before you do that, let me just comment on one thing. Yeah. On, the, 
on the right hand side of the tr uh, of the screen about midway up there are three trees mm -hmm. if you look at the one to the far left the third over that tree is still very much in uh, in evidence at the corner of fish creek and 36 go ahead So this is what the site looks like today. And the interesting thing is, and I'll go back and forth between the photos as we're showing them, but um, when you look at the first one and you realize what direction we're looking at towards Lumpy Ridge, you know, that's not Lake Estes back there, even though those are just the shadows and the contrast and the photo and the light. That's actually Stanley, what would be Stanley Meadows and then become Lake Estes. Um, so you can kind of see where Highway 36 comes in and it's along the original road coming into town. Now, those three trees Jim was talking about, if that tree on the very right in the foreground was not there, you'd be able to see those three little trees back there. Um, I've always been amazed that they've barely grown at all. Yeah, and if you go out there, that's that one tree is where the Joel Estes monument is today. Yeah. So I'll go ahead and jump to the, it's the same site, but a different view. And... Um, I know there's a story behind getting these three original photos. Yeah, this is the story is kind of fun. We, uh, when we were putting together uh, the original book, we decided to spend a day out at the National uh, Rocky Mountain National Park archives uh, and take photographs of their photographs. And we did, and we came back with a whole slew of, of photographs, many of which found their way into the book. Well, in looking at these three photographs, Nick all of a sudden discovered, you know, we may have three photographs of the same site, but they really were taken originally because they gave the effect put together of a panorama. And so uh, we decided we would retake this panorama. Uh, if you notice the car in the foreground, in the, in the new one, that's my car, and the old one is the probably the car of, of, of the ranger uh, who actually, I think it was J James McLaughlin who took the uh, photograph. Um, it's probably his car. But this is the Estes Evans Dunraven Ranch because after, after Evans uh, moved out, the Earl of Dunraven purchased the property and absorbed those buildings into his ranch. And you can see the barn uh, uh, over here on the right-hand side uh, be, which became kind of the anchor of the Dunraven Ranch. And that barn was there, by the way, until uh, about 1950 when Lake Estes was created and that whole, whole area became the, 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 the smaller arm of Lake Estes, as you can see today. And then we'll talk about it a little more. And, and Mick Klinger, who's the other photographer, he's really more of the the expert with the cameras and the Photoshop. Um, I was just kind of the middleman that tried to keep the project moving along. But um, one of the things that was big is we use Photoshop so that we can overlay our, um, we have all the older photos scanned and then we use Photoshop to pretty much create a ghost image with the new image and overlay them to see how closely they align. So this one you can see in the background with the peaks like the thumb on Prospect Mountain over on the left. Uh, you can one thing, Derek, that struck me in looking at this photograph, now the one, the, the, the new one, the now one. Yeah. I'll put that back up there, the now one. That, is that a white tent from the Irish, Scottish Irish Festival over there? I think, I think it is. So that, that further memorializes the site. Yeah. And that's one of the funny things about this as well, when you're doing the then and now shoots, um, Luckily, being in Estes Park, we have so many peaks that we can match up in the backgrounds if they're captured. And um, so that makes it a little bit easier. But when you really start looking at the details, when you overlay the ghost images, that's when you start noticing where some of the trees are the exact same, some of the roads are in the same spot. Um, you notice where a building isn't, so then you are able to just walk over there and um, kind of find some remains of it. Uh, and gives you all sorts of clues once you really start looking at all the details. So you can learn a lot just from trying to match up the photos. And of course, that the the uh, the, then, the now photograph was taken before the 2013 flood. So yeah. uh, that's the way it used to look like. We have a quick question, guys. Yeah. Um, it says Jim's car is missing in the book photo. Did it get photoshopped out for the book? 
Oh dear, did it? I don't think so, but I actually have the book right here and I know we're on site five. So let me jump to it. We may have put a different photo in the, in the new one. For the new one, actually, you know what we did now that I'm realizing it, since you just brought it up, the new one is actually after the flood. So this would have been mixed original photo back in 2005. We, and we probably should have put all three because then it's, it's uh, not only it's then, it's then, now, and now, or super now. Exactly. And that's the other thing to realize with the then and now shoots too. Um, even when you're taking what you consider the now photo, it also documents that in time and will eventually be an old then photo. So it's a funny thing to keep in mind when we think we're contemporizing all of it and really all we're doing is adding documentation to a specific site at a single moment in time. So that's a good question. Good observation. We should be doing field trips with some of our participants. <laughs> yeah, they'd be helping us out. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, let's we'll talk about this one. Yeah, this is the Charles Partridge Adams House. And by the way, in one of the galleries down in Denver is selling a marvelous Charles Partridge Adams watercolor of Moraine Park. It's currently on sale. Uh, I'd love to own it, but it's pretty pricey, nevertheless. Charles Partridge Adams was one of Estes Park's most famous uh, artists. Uh, he came to Colorado uh, in the latter part of the 19th century uh, because his two young girls were down with tuberculosis. And another example of Colorado uh, drawing all kinds of interesting people who had, had health problems. Uh, he managed to uh, finagle uh, the Earl of Dunraven to give him a small piece of land along Fish Creek. And he built a, a summer cottage, uh, which had a room uh, which housed his own uh, particular uh, private studio. It was a, a room which, uh, where the ceiling was way up. And on the dark paneling, he actually painted a number of birds. Uh, when the house was taken down, uh, to create the create uh, the space for the current uh, uh, what's it called now the uh, solitude yes yeah, solitude would... cabins um, the owner was nice enough to alert uh, Frank Hicks and Marty Casey and Madison and I and we went over on a Saturday afternoon and sawed down a portion of that wall with the bird pictures on it uh, we <laughs> it, it became a very handsome uh, bedboard. Uh, and we have a picture of that big board in the, in the, in the new book. And what's interesting about the site, of course, is that this, no, this house no longer exists. So you can see that the then photo, which Mick actually took as the then photo for the 2006 edition, uh, they just put the road in. They hadn't even really put in any landscaping or anything else. And that's really how we were able to line it up so you can see um, the sidewalk across the street has that little niche on it um, and then goes to the left and that's what I used to line it up to take the now photo. And then the other fun thing about this site was um, in the original then and now book they were able to capture this image and uh, you have that little birdhouse up there and the current owners of Solitude um, were, were very sentimental with it and they actually left it up there. So for our new book, I went and took the photo again. I couldn't get it exactly lined up because there's a nice cabin there now, um, but I could get some height on the, the, the patio itself. And then for the um, trees themselves, we, we went ahead and you can see the transition in the slides just really lined up the birdhouse itself at the right angle. Um, so it's fun to capture some little details like that. And um, that's a little little known fact that that, um, that little birdhouse is still there. It's also a good example of how fast things change. When we initially took that photograph, we knew the change was in the wind. We had no idea they were going to tear down that house. So uh, yeah, the way it goes. In the nick of time. <clears throat> So this was a fun one to reshoot. Um, this is a photo that I've always enjoyed um, that's in our collection. It's Mary's Lake at its original size before it was um, really dammed up like it is today and is much larger than it, it used to be. But I love all the cattle in the foreground. Um, a lot of our original pioneers and the names we're familiar with, they came up here um, to run farms and to, to, to run cattle. 
as well. And at that time, before Lake Estes, this was one of the uh, one of those centrally located lakes where a lot of them would would uh, put all their cattle. So that's all the cattle there in the foreground. Um, not like you really see today, unless you're hanging out at McGregor Ranch. When the uh, 1914 Arapaho came through on that uh, trip where they were naming landforms, uh, one of the sites they visited was uh, Mary's Lake. Uh, and apparently they found some teepee rings down along the shore. Of course, the whole, the whole uh, scene has been changed with the Colorado Big Thompson project of the, of the 30s and the 40s, uh, that uh, there's now a, a dike all the way around and a road going all the way around and the lake is uh, considerably uh, larger, uh, except when they let the water out. So uh, there, there you go. I think the date on that first photograph Derek, I think it's about 1880. And didn't you tell me that those are, are uh, cattle that belong to the Elkhorn uh, Ranch, uh, Elkhorn Lodge, or at um, least the James family? I always assumed that they were the James family because Eleanor James talks about um, keeping their cattle over there and how close they were to the Ferguson family because they were just over the hill there <laughs> at the Highlands. And they'd also keep their cattle there. Right. And they had they had some of the more significant um, numbers of cattle. What, what's interesting in this photograph is I don't think you can see any of the buildings for the uh, Ferguson's Lodge, which would have been up on that up on that ridge. I think it would have been just over the ridge. I remember going out to shoot this one with you because I was kind of getting excited because I thought it'd give me a good reason to crawl out on some of those uh, little knobby rocks out there and have a little adventure. And it ended up being just just past those rocks up the road a little bit further. And so um, it was so if pretty- we see, If we could see over the hill, we probably could see the buildings of the, of the Ferguson's yeah. place then. Definitely. Guys, we have another question. Was Ferguson's place there when the first photo was taken? Yes, it was. They were there by about 1875. They, were, they, they came in and, and, and picked, that, uh, picked that spot on Mary's Lake Road uh, because of the pond, which is still there, that was a water source. Uh, and so Homestead Cabin gave way to small resorts over time. And then, of course, Mr. Howlett moved in next door. That's now the dental office. But Mr. Howlett was a, a rancher, a good friend of the Ferguson's, and so he uh, built his summer home, summer cottage next door, uh, built without a kitchen so he could take his meals because he wanted to take his meals with the Ferguson's at their, at their place. What you can see, by the way, on the shore uh, here, that's where the old road, the yeah. old road came, came, uh, came across the, uh, the western side rather than the eastern side as it does today. Uh, and so you can see where that car is, what would have been the old road going up and over the hill and then ultimately past the Ferguson's. Go oh, over onto the left of the photo. Yeah. One more question, fellas. Was it yeah. mostly Dunraven land? Mostly what? Dunraven land? Uh, no, well, Mary's Lake. I don't know who claimed that there were, there were, I don't think so. Uh, I think there were a couple of other uh, claimants beside the Fergusons. Um, I think the area where Mary's Lake Lodge was part of the of the James Buchanan homestead steaded land, but I'd have to look that up. Yeah, I'm not sure off the top of my head. That's a good question. I, I like I like these questions that they're asking. Yeah, it's, they're, it's good engagement. They're, they're tough questions. Yeah, well, that too. <laughs> but what, what, one of the one of the questions that comes up is how did Mary's Lake get its name and one of the suggestions is that the Mary was James Buchanan's wife so and that uh, the other story is that the, it was named by Rocky Mountain Jim but you know we just don't know yeah and then one of the things too to notice with the photograph um, again with that um, with that type of background and those peaks you'd think it would just line up perfectly and um, I kind of look at in my the way my brain works visually is when I'm looking at a photo, I kind of, and then go out to reshoot it. I, I try to make what I'm looking at two dimensional, like the photo. So I'm just kind of looking at the, the shapes and the patterns that the mountains are making in the background and trying to line it up. And sometimes it works out. Sometimes it doesn't. This one does match up. However, the size of the peaks change and it has to do with my specific lens. 
Um, when Mick goes out and takes a photo, he has a very nice camera with uh, multiple lenses that he can take or switch out on his camera. Um, I'm usually just traveling around with my pocket camera, taking like a hundred shots in one site and hoping one of them lines up and keep my fingers crossed. So this one is interesting because uh, by using my now photo, um, it did match up. However, you can see that the depth of field changes uh, with those peaks in the background. And um, it's kind of just the way that it is and I have to be okay with it after a while. All right, this is further down the road then, still on Mary's Lake, but looking towards the uh, Beaver Point. And I don't know if you have any context you wanna share about this one, Jim. Well, I think this is a fun photograph uh, for a number of reasons. One, uh, the, the road in the photograph is exactly, almost precisely the current road. So the, the road hasn't changed. Uh, what's interesting is what you can see uh, in this photograph. And I, Derek, do you know the date of this, of the, of the, of the then photograph? It's probably about 1930, 35, something like that. I, I think so. It might even be a little bit later, but um, I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, unfortunately. Well, there are a number of things that are interesting. On the far right-hand side is a little livery, and that was there for years and years. In fact, I can remember uh, coming up here early, and that livery was still was still there. In fact, you can see the horses in the corral out, yeah. out, out there. Um, uh, and then on the other side, uh, as, you, as you go down Murray's Lake Road, uh, where it comes and hits Moraine, uh, you can see the building, which is, well, for years was the, um, uh, the uh, what was the restaurant there? It was now, now Bird and Jim's. Uh, it was, oh. so that's, that's very much in, uh, in focus. I think the building across the street is still there, the one on High Drive. Uh, what's interesting is the, the little uh, barn, mm -hmm. which is across the street from where Bird and Jim's now stands, down in the meadow no, is no longer there. Uh, the, uh, the row of buildings on the right side of the road going down towards the intersection with Moraine, where the other side now stands, obviously they're not there, and neither are the little cabins uh, that are in that, in that foreground. Uh, what's there now, of course, is the, uh, is the RV park. Guys, we have another question, or at least a comment from uh, Mr. Barber. He says the car is a mid-1930s GM, although the photo could be a little bit later. Um, and he said it was the Sun Deck for about 65 years. Sun Deck, of course. There we go. <laughs> and especially since John is here, uh, John Barber, we should yes. Yes. thank him in front of everybody because we actually had a session of uh, where we asked John Barber to come in because he's such so good obviously everyone just witnessed it at looking at cars and being able to date them where we had a bunch of undated photographs that happened to have automobiles in them so the three of us sat down and flipped through those and he was able to help us narrow down those dates a lot yeah john, so john, john. john's knowledge of cars it's just amazing it used to a tremendous help so john thank you again and this was a funny one to capture because um, we actually thought it was up the road a little bit higher because there's another bend in the road. And we always, if we ever have to go into somebody's property, we always ask them. So we went to the door, we knocked on it. Uh, nobody answered. Turned out it was a two unit house. So there was something up, a unit upstairs. We went upstairs, knocked on it. Nobody answered. Um, we thought, well, we'll have to just come back later. And as we started driving down the road, we realized, uh, I think we were in the wrong spot. I'm glad we came down the road a little ways because it was down here. And what's interesting is those trees in the foreground obviously have grown up since the original photograph was taken. There's one there, but I'm not sure that it's, it's any of the ones in the existing photograph. Yeah. Go back one more time. What's that? It's okay. Never mind. Uh, okay. I got, these, I got these backwards, so. <laughs> okay. But we can look at the the Lone Pine Trading Post. Right, that and that Lone Pine Trading Post was just inside the uh, park boundaries, at the end of the High Drive. You know, the High Drive uh, was the original entrance into the park. It ran up to, toward Upper Beaver Meadows and on the side of Deer Mountain. Well, an enterprising lady 
uh, decided uh, this would be a good place because of the historic Lone Pine across the street to set up a trading post uh, and a, 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 a place where people going into the park could stop and get knickknacks and whatever. What does it say on the sign? Something about something about wares. Uh, this is a Cheryl Pennington, by the way, hand colored. Cheryl yeah. was good enough to uh, uh, give us some of her clatworthy photographs that she had hand colored. And so we're very grateful to, uh, to her for having done that. Uh, we had a difficult time finding this site. And now if you want to go back to the, uh, to the, to the now photograph, maybe you can explain how we found it. Yeah, of course the road is still there off High Drive. It's very narrow. Um, Jim almost got us stuck turn, trying to turn his Jeep around at one point in time. <laughs> Luckily it's a Jeep. But what we were really looking for is if you look just beyond the building, kind of in between the building and the sign to the left there is a big rock. So we were looking for that specifically. And then the other big giveaway is up in the top right corner, you can see an outcropping of some rocks. So we we're looking for that as well. That was not as easy to see in the now photo because there's a tree kind of blocking it, but it is back there. And then there you can see that big rock in the foreground. And the Lone Pine is a neat site. Um, it was very iconic. There's uh, so many postcards for it. Um, it's really neat. And then um, it eventually, uh, unfortunately, people would take needles off of it um, for their own souvenirs. And um, eventually, of course, that killed the tree. So there was one replanted. It's not quite as dynamic as the original one, but um, it's so iconic. It's, it's what we ended up using to uh, rebrand the museum and come up with our new logo um, with, with the, the Lone Pine. Speaking of postcards, we ought to uh, acknowledge the great help that Bobby Heisterkamp gave us in loaning us some of her postcards uh, for interior shots of some of the resorts. So that's an added feature in the book. Her photograph, her postcard collection, as you know, is, is, is one of a kind and wonderful. And as always, she was very generous in making those. Looking up, we would say, Bobby, do you have a a, a postcard of X, Y, or Z, and she'd go and look, and in most cases, she was able to respond right away. So, uh, Bobby, thank you, too. Definitely. Yeah, and I'm hoping we can do a program where we focus on lodges and, um, and from the Then and Now book. And one thing that a lot of people don't realize, so to begin with, the museum collection, we have over 8,000 loose photographs. Um, some of them are extremely awesome you know we have the building of Elkhorn Lodge stuff like that some of them are like fuzzy chipmunks running by um, which people still take today but um, it, when you're using all of those and you're really looking at lodges we have very few interior ones however when you start looking at postcards those were the the uh, you know a commercial photographer that would capture some of those interiors so we thought it'd be important to give those sites more character to, to capture some of the interiors and include them in the new book so the other thing we decided to do with the new book too was to travel a little further outside of Estes Park. We all know that, you know, coming up 34, 36, or even Highway 7 is part of uh, the, the trip in into Estes Park and part of the Estes Park experience. So when we were adding sites, we, we decided to go down and, and do a few more sites on Highway 36. Um, and so I'll let Jim go ahead and talk about the Hall Ranch here. Well, this, this is a photograph came from Byron Hall. Many of you remember Byron, uh, who was very active in the community for a lot of years. I was a member of the uh, steam team up at the Stanley Hotel, uh, became a big aficionado of Stanley steamers. Uh, but his family had been in Estes Park, the Hall family, had been in Estes Park and, and lived down in Lyons for a number of years. And this is the Hall uh, homestead uh, which stood uh, out there on Highway 36. It's, it's hard to explain exactly where it was unless you went down and actually saw the site. But even then, the site today is almost unrecognizable. Yeah, I'll show the site as I took it for the book. This is the Hall, Hall Ranch House. It's, it's probably about two miles up from the Apple Valley Bridge. Mm -hmm. For a couple of years, there was a Rockin' River, a, a resort called Rockin' River, uh, which was taken out by the 2013 flood. So just like a number of the other photographs, uh, the, uh, the, the, the now photograph uh, no longer is a now photograph. Yeah, and this was another one where it, it's very difficult to 
um, it's hard to see that these sites actually line up. Um, it's a little bit of a leap of faith um, that we got the right spot. But when I was actually down taking it, I was able to, to line up the ridge lines in the back. And of course, when you're on site, you can walk around trees, walk up the road a little bit and make sure that you're getting into the right spot. Um, so back to the right, um, that ridge line itself is, it really is back there in the now photo. It's just covered up by the trees, so you can't really see it. Um, I was some of those big rocks in the foreground from the then photo would still be there, but they're, they're completely gone. Well, if you go back to and look at the stone wall, which looks like it's providing a kind of a, not a barrier exactly, but it's part of the front yard, uh, you can see some of those rocks today if you go down and, and, and look at the property, yeah. not from the front so much, but from the side. Definitely. And then from there, we decided to go up the road a little way again, up to what used to be called the Welch's Resort. Right. And you may not remember this as Shelley's Cottages, which was there until again, the, the, the uh, 2013 flood wiped them out and they, they never reopened. But they, this is a fun, a fun place because Welch Res Welch's Resort above Lyons was for probably two decades or more, uh, a very large and uh, functioning and popular resort for many people. Instead of coming up to Estes Park, they would go up the canyon a ways uh, and stay at Welch's. And Billy Welch was a, a fascinating guy. He was Oxford educated, but came to Colorado uh, uh, for a while, practiced law, and then went into uh, uh, raising cattle and taking care of tourists. Uh, Welch's Resort really enters the Estes Park record on June the 29th of 1903 because that's the day that F.O. Stanley uh, stopped there in his little steam car on his way making his epic entrance into Estes Park. And you all know the story. Billy Welch was asked, here's, here's more, poor Mr. Stanley, who's been sick with tuberculosis, uh, doesn't weigh 100 pounds. Uh, Stanley says, will you, uh, will you send somebody along with me to help carry the water from my steam car? Uh, Welch looks at the car, looks at the road, says, I won't waste a man on that, on that mission. And so Stanley comes on uh, by himself in an hour and 97 minutes or something close to that later, uh, he's calling back to Welch and giving him, uh, telling him hello from Estes Park. Uh, he stopped at the, uh, at the store, the only store in Estes Park where there was a telephone and made his call back to Welch's Resort. So all of this kind of uh, factors into the F.O. Stanley story, as well as being a, a resort on the, as it says, the Longmont Estes Park Highway, uh, which for years was really a, uh, a favorite stopping point. And keep that story in mind, everybody, because we have a, a nice shot of F.O. Stanley in one of his steamers here later that we, that we tried to match up as well. Um, here's the look today, again, after the 2013 flood, um, which, which really changed the entire um, um, sides of the river itself. Um, this one, in, in trying to match it up, it was, a, it was a little difficult, but I was, I was looking at the ridge on the left there, and then kind of in the middle ground, um, you can see uh, another ridge jutting out to the road. And um, whoop, I'm going to go forward again. Um, so you can kind of see it in my photo, too. It's pretty well lit up uh, from the sunlight there. Um, this was one where it's kind of difficult because the original one was not taken in the water. You can see right at the bottom there, the road bends back. And so I'm convinced this person is not standing in the water. Um, they may have been, but, or they might have done what I did, which was, um, leap from boulder to boulder because I didn't want to get my feet wet that day. Um, and I just had to take it from the boulder that had the best perspective to the original. And what's really sad is that lovely wall on the right-hand side is yeah. completely gone. And, and that's gorgeous in the photo. And then the structure is back there too. So much higher up on the road, um, this was a new, new site that we decided to add in there. And again, Jim did a great job, I think, of not only finding um, new photos of sites that he had already had in the original book, so we could have a different look and different perspective of some of those sites, but also then 
um, just kind of accumulating interesting photos that you would come across here and there. And then we were able to put those into the book. Um, you have to understand it is a large book. Uh, we make fun of that a lot um, because it's big. But um, it was kind of funny putting it together because there was definitely a time there where Jim just told me, um, tell me when we have too many sites. And I thought, you're asking the wrong person to tell you that because I want to add to it too. And it actually came up to our designer um, where we kept sending him site after site after site. And he came back to us and said, just because you guys are looking at this digitally, I don't think you understand how large this book is starting to get <laughs> and how heavy it's starting to get. So you might want to stop. So then we added about 10 more and then we stopped. But this was one we wanted to put in there. Well, what I like about this photo, a number, number of things. First of all, uh, on the left-hand side where, that, where the car is facing us, that's Mall Road today. So yeah, that kind of orients you. I love that sign with the various uh, mile markers telling us how far it is to Colorado Springs and Casper, Wyoming and Denver. And, uh, and then the other thing to note, and if we get rid of this ballot in front of us, you can see it better. <laughs> So people, we should vote and we will get rid of the. Yeah, so uh, just because it is hard to see, I've, I've zoomed in on some of this and it's funny because the, the sign that's furthest to the right, so the darkest sign, but it says St. Brain Canyon to Longmont. Right. Um, and then in the white part of the sign, it says the shortest way in quotations. Right. Um, so they're definitely promoting that. The larger sign going to the left there is of course the Big Thompson Canyon. And Loveland is listed first, um, but they are they have Greeley, Fort Morgan, Sterling. Um, they have everything listed on there, plus how many miles. And Yellowstone, Yellowstone National Park, or Yellowstone yeah. Park, yeah. And yeah, Sterling, Casper, Fort Morgan. Right. Um, it's, it's all on there. Uh, Derek, uh, talk about the, the position of the road vis 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 in this photograph vis-a-vis -vis 36 today. Well, I think it can definitely be seen when we look at the uh, photo for today. It's fairly dramatic change, change in grade as well and direction. Um, what we were really looking for here was lining up uh, Mount Olympus in the background there and then lining it up with the, the middle ground uh, ridge line, basically. And we were able to capture that, but this just shows how dramatic uh, the road has changed. And even though, I mean, we all know how big this hill is because um, we all drive it all the time. Um, and sometimes you get stuck behind a slow car and you really just get to take it in. But what's interesting is if you look at that car going up the hill on the right, so going down what is today Highway 36, you can see how they did it back then with the grade where it's up one bump, up the next bump. And I'm assuming that would just continue all the way up. Um, whereas today, you know, we can just go straight up the hill. And of course, back then the scene was the the, the view was not marred by the all the towers and uh, no wires. There are some light there are some light poles in here, of course, and and uh, power lines and things, yeah. but um, yeah. not quite as big as they are today. Right. So it is interesting to see how dramatic some of the sites change, um, even the just day to day ones like this intersection. And we decided to include another roadway here. Yeah, this is, we decided this is what, about 1955. And I think John was helpful here again, although I'm not sure if there are any cars there. But actually the, the, the view today is not much different than it was in 1955 with a couple of exceptions and we'll talk about those. One thing that we discovered remained is that lamppost on the left-hand side. It's in virtually the same place whether it's the same exact lamppost or not, but it's certainly very close in mm -hmm. style to it. Uh, what we liked about this was not only is this one of the iconic views uh, coming into Estes Park, but for, well, since 1919, and when, when the tower went up on the, uh, the theater, uh, that's been a part of the iconic view coming down into the village. But today on the right-hand side closes up now is where the Safeway and of course, the new, uh, the new uh, hospital center, the emergency center is. Um, and in the old photograph, you can see what was there before. And there for, for about 40 years was, uh, was the, uh, the livery. 
Yeah, is that Silver Lane? Yeah, Silver Lane, Odie, the Odie White yeah, side, right. Silver Lane Staples, yeah. And uh, it, it was there from, uh, my notes say from 1900, and let me see if I can read my own writing, 1938 to 2000, 19, 1938 to 2010. So it's there for a long time. And the, the thing that's interesting is you can see how they widen the highway, but they widen it to the right side and they cut into the hillside there. So even though the, that power or that light pole, sorry, is in the, almost the same spot and the, the um, left side of the highway is almost in the same spot, uh, the, right, the right side is what was expanded to come into town. I think one of, the, one of the puzzles we had to deal with in trying to date the original one was whether or not the visitor center was there. You remember that discussion we had? Yeah, I know we were trying to see it down to the left there. It's hard to see even in, in the today's photo. Right. The photo. Um, but that, that definitely would have come later. Um, yeah, and it's always funny, you know, when you're out shooting photographs in Estes and inevitably somebody drives by and honks at you and then later on they say, what were you doing? And you say, oh, I've been working. When really it just looks like I'm walking around with the historian laureate uh, with my pocket camera and we're just looks like we're hitchhiking on the highway almost. <laughs> well, that's especially true when you have the museum van. They look at it strangely. So here we get back to F.O. Stanley. Ah, yes. Okay. Want me to talk about this? That, that's yeah, the little that's... car. That's the little car he brought up from Lyons. You can see how small it is. So he's over there on the left, kind of in the background behind the cattle. He's hard to see, but once you see him, you can see him. Right. And he's in an open, open Stanley steamer, so you can see, you know, the outfit he's wearing. And he's coming back down from the Rustic Hotel. That's the Shep Houston Hotel. Uh, opened in 1900, so it hadn't been open very long when, uh, when Stanley came by in his little car. Uh, one of the fun things that Derek and I discovered in the course of doing these, doing the history, is that the Shep Houston presence in that part of Estes Park went far beyond the rustic hotel and the, and the cabins that are there. Uh, as a matter of fact, this, the, this cattle here are really part of the working, the working ranch and farm that Shep Houston uh, had going for him. And up here to the right hand side, it's not in the view, are some incredibly old and interesting farm buildings that we had a chance one day to, to go in. Uh, they certainly rival, uh, not only in age, but in historical importance, anything out at the McGregor Ranch. So uh, uh, that, was a, that was an important discovery in the course of doing this, doing this book and getting to know some of the neighbors. And what and I like about this, so this is the H. Bar G. Ranch today. And um, what's interesting about it is to learn later on too, when the Livingston family buys it, they have a house in town and this is their house out of town. And then um, this was also something that F.O. Stanley would talk about as one of his favorite drives, you know, to get away from the hotel and the, the hustle and bustle of town, drive out to H. Bar G. Ranch um, out uh, off of Dry Gulch. And so it's, it's neat to have the photo to match up to the story. Yeah, he thought the view from the rustic was the best in the, in the valley because you're looking back at the front range. Yeah. And so I went out to try to capture it. Um, this is a very difficult one to do. I probably shot this, reshot this the most times out of any other photograph um, because I would get so frustrated with it and I could not get the right alignment. Um, so you can see where FO was and the rocks behind him specifically. And I was trying to line all of those rocks up and they're all there. Um, but they're just at a slightly awkward angle and I could just never get it right. So this was my best attempt at it. Um, I'll go back, toggle back and forth so you can kind of see that. But the other thing that's very noticeable is you see the H. Bar G. Ranch house um, kind of to the right side over there. And it's an impressive structure. And I'll actually look at it on the next slide. But all of a sudden it disappears. We all know that it's still there today, but um, come to find out that later on, the property owners um, went ahead and put in a, a little dam of some type because of the watersheds that are up there. And so that actually blocks uh, the house that still stands back there today. And of so course, there's, no, there's no sign of the old of, of the road either. The existing road is goes up 
Yeah. Off the yeah. And then there are still some cattle kept there. So there, one of the times I went out there, I had to kind of keep an eye on them while I was trying to get the photo, which it was not successful. But this this one turned out pretty good. And then to follow up on that, this is the Rustic Hotel, which is now the H Bar G Ranch. Um, and this was a really fun one to to go and shoot. We were lucky enough at the museum to to host a little historic site tour out there uh, a few summers back and got to know some of the current owners and they were very generous by letting the public come back there and and take a look at some of those structures out there and This is the original one, and you can just see how impressive it is um, and how little it has changed um, so it's it's a really just fascinating sight. Go back to the original one, Beric. The, the little building over here to the left, is that, is that the, um, what, what, what's the name of that cabin? Do you remember we were told? Um, yeah, I forget the names of all of them that are out there and they have so many of them now. Um, but it's, it's definitely one of the original ones because this is from one of W.T. Park's books that was published in 1909 or 1910 where he'd pull about a dozen or a dozen and a half sites of town and uh, just put a little booklet together and sell it. And we have three or four of those in our collection and th that's what this one is from. But I can't remember the name of it. And then back to the right above the, the rustic hotel as it's called in this one is a tent cabin you can see up there on a platform. I'm wondering if that cabin isn't the one that Henry, Henry Rogers, the Englishman built. The, 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 story, the story is that uh, Rogers was an architect uh, came to America, came to Estes Park for his health, like uh, like Stanley did and others, uh, and he got involved with Shep Houston because uh, uh, Shep Houston's sister-in-law, there was a relative who came from the same part of England that Henry Rogers did. In any event, they got to be friends. Uh, Rogers actually lived with the family for a while, and the story is that in return for doing the the drawings, the architectural work on that hotel, uh, Rogers was allowed to build his own cabin and keep it, uh, even after uh, the uh, main lodge passed into other hands. So that would be an interesting mystery to solve. Just one more, one more puzzle. Yeah, definitely. It, it's definitely got those architectural features, though. Yes. And you can kind of see it in the background of the now photograph. It's behind those two cabins in the tree. You can still see that rounded window. Um, and you can see it in the, the original one there. And then I, I don't know why, but, you know, I always blame it on looking at too many I spies when I was a kid. But, you know, I start looking at things like the chimney in the, in the middle of the, the rustic there and to see how that's changed with a flagpole that's up above it. And, of course, now they have a flagpole down below. The chimney's still, still there, but it's, um, it's been modified a little bit and it's definitely a lot taller than it used to be. Um, and then some of these I just nerd out too much on and I start looking at the stone foundation and seeing if the stones are still all there and do they still look the same those types of things. The, the new book has a, an interior photograph again from Bobby's collection yeah. uh, of the of the, what the main parlor looked like so that's kind of fun as well. Uh, this is uh, Al Birch's house. Um, so it's Jacob's Ladder. Now we mostly call it the Birch Ruins. Um, we're actually doing a lot of work up there currently with a state grant where we're going to put interpretive panels up there and a couple down at the cabin as well and hoping to, to finish that up this fall. Um, I like this photo a lot because it's very telling of, of the structure. Mainly one of the things that we're going to be doing as well is extending the walking platform that we have installed there out to the patio area. And it's always amazing to go out there to the site today and a lot of people say, um, you know, why'd you put the platform so high? And you can look to the left of this photo into the patio area and see that it was actually at one time filled, backfilled with stone. I have no idea where all the stone went. I imagine probably over the wall and down to the creek. <laughs> down the hill. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, um, but that's why we want to rebuild it to that, um, to that level so that it's more like the original experience. And that's that why, even though we don't have an intact photo of this site, it's a very important historic photo to, to, that captured some of those features. Albert uh, was the uh, city editor of the Denver Post. And one of the things that we took a stab at in the new book is a kind of revisionist history of what happened to that site. Because the original story was that uh, 
uh, he built the house, built it, uh, put a put a stained glass uh, door in front, uh, and the house was called Jacob's Ladder after uh, Jacob of the Bible's many colored coats. Well, the story is that uh, the uh, mason who did the uh, uh, work on the house extended the floor joists uh, underneath the fireplace, and they caught fire. Uh, what we've what we've learned since, I believe, is that. Uh, uh, Birch had actually sold the place before the fire took place uh, and that he had to go to court uh, to sue the, the person who had bought it because the asset uh, which the mortgage was placed upon uh, uh, was no longer there. And so he went, to, to, he went and sued uh, to regain uh, the money that was owed to him on that house. Anyway, uh, then he, after, after uh, he leaves this, this structure, uh, he builds the house which is down along the creek, which now the town also owns. And Derek, you may want to talk about that. Yeah, the, the birch cabin down below. Um, and it's in a gorgeous spot. Um, just looking over uh, Black Canyon Creek and kind of looking towards downtown almost. And it's a very quaint spot. Uh, the family used it as, well, Al Birch used it as a writer's retreat, and the family used it, of course, as a summer retreat up until the 1980s. Um, at that time, when they were starting to think about selling it, there was a proposal to turn it into a commercial property and, and potentially a strip mall of some type um, along that property. And that's where the town got involved in the land trust and thankfully open, uh, purchased it to, to preserve it as an open space. And then because of the structures on there, they, they've been listed with the state and the museums in charge of the ruins and the, and the, uh, the cabin itself. Um, and then we have our parks department. They put in some really nice trails and they rechristened it the Centennial, Centennial Park in, for 2017. And people donated towards it and they got some really nice benches up there and, and everything else. And, um, one of the cool things about it too is there's a little, um, we've been able to find some images of the Stanley nine hole golf course that was in front of the hotel. And, um, and they, they came actually very close to the ruins. So eventually our plans are to, to mark out where, where the second green would have been just behind the, the ruins themselves hitting towards where the Safeway sits today. Um, it sounds like a grueling hole, but the first hole would have been even worse and almost twice as long. <laughs> And the now photo is a funny one. It's actually one of mixed photos, but he always likes to talk about it because we, we definitely love our, our trees here in Estes Park by all means, but they do sometimes get in the way of um, our now photos because we have so many more trees than there used to be. And, and a lot of them have gotten a lot larger. And so he was actually able, instead of sawing off a branch so that he could get a better shot of this image, even though it's blocked somewhat by the tree, um, came up with the novel idea of uh, bringing a bungee cord out and go ahead and strap and back one of the branches so that he could at least get a good image of the, the entrance to the birch ruins. And he had to climb the tree to do it. <laughs> Derek, we have a question. Do we know who yeah. the man in the photo is from the, yeah, on that original? On the I'm not sure. Do you know, Jim? I, I haven't got a clue, no. It's, it's from the uh, Rocky Mountain National Park collection. It's actually not in our archive. Um, I'm not sure who it is. I, I do not think that it's Al Birch, though. No. Um, the clothing give give you know some indication of the time frame, but I, I'm I'm more curious about what's behind him and what's going on with that metal door there, yeah. because there's still a lot of mysteries to that building, and um, that door no longer exists. But there are some very heavy iron hinges in that concrete there. Um, and, uh, uh, I'm, I'm still wondering what that little section of the ruins were, was actually used for originally. Well, that you have two fireplaces, right? You have the one yeah. on the, on the left to used to, to warm the main room. And that's you where the fire the would have started. Kitchen, right? The kitchen yeah. area. And I wonder if it was a, like a two-sided fireplace where you could actually cook from outside as well as in. Yeah, it could be. It, it's, um, You'd have to look at it. Yeah. And the way that it goes with history is, you know, it usually, as soon as you think you're solving one thing, you, you find out that you have 10 other questions. And this is the, I know we're coming up on our time here, but this is um, our, our last site. And for everybody that's listening in, if you have any general questions um, about the book too, or, or, or things like that, feel free to type them in and, and we'll do our best to answer them. I'll also give my contact information at the end because we'll follow up on anything that we can as well. 
Um, but this was the, the last site that I included for our program today. And this is the, the site of uh, the Old Man Mountain Ski Site. Right. And it was pressed into service first in 1924. And as it, as it evolved, it was used both winters and summers. Uh, in the summertime, the Park Service would bring snow down from Trail Ridge, dump it on that hill, and so they would have summer ski, uh, jumping events as well. Uh, and for a brief time, uh, the newspaper said that Estes Park became the San Moritz of, of, uh, of winter sports uh, in, in Colorado. Uh, but, and we have some photographs in the book uh, for, taken from the top looking down uh, with a skier about to make a jump. And you can see in that photograph the number of cars that are parked in the, in the meadow below, giving some suggestion of just how popular that place was as a place to go and watch the watch the skiing events. Could you guys orient us just a little bit more specifically? Maybe you're going to do that right now as to where this jump was. Sure. Um, this is on the the west side of town. So so Old Man Mountain is uh, just west of um, uh, Elkhorn Lodge. So we're still kind of close to downtown, but um, on the, the, geez, I guess it would be, am I giving too many directions? The north side of Old Man Mountain, there is, uh, there's some condos there. And so this is something that you can see from Fall River if you're driving back there, but also uh, it, it's a lot easier to see when you're actually up on Wonder View and you look out for it. Um, if you're very close and walking by it, there's a huge red sign there that says no sledding, um, just in case people are tempted because if it makes for a good ski jump, it's got to make for a good sled run as well. Um, but that that's where it was. And this is um, one of those that's, that was, you know, it's pretty easy to locate. Um, and with Old Man Mountain up there um, in the top left to try to match up the crags on it and the shadows on it, uh, it was a pretty easy one to reshoot. Uh, what's interesting is when Jim took me to the site, um, we did have to go up on a little knoll there um, to get the picture. And I thought our angle was going to be too high, but um, really, even for the foreground, it's it's it, it's pretty much a, a solid match. And, and I think you... one of the favorite things we have in our collection are those tickets that we have from the summer ski jump on Old Man Mountain. Uh, it's pretty see, cool to see that happening in Estes Park in July, um, you know, this ski jump taking place. And the other what? cool thing we have to go along with that is we do have some actual film footage of people doing stuff at the ski jump and, and actually utilizing it. And to see it in a moving picture, of course, is phenomenal. Yeah, those motion pictures are great because they're, we don't have, given the popularity of the site, uh, and as I say, it's, they used it first in 1924, they used it last in 1951, so they've got a lot of use over a lot of years. There are surprisingly few uh, photographs like this one which really are, we can even use for the purposes we, uh, we wanted to put it to. Yeah, I agree. So that's what we have for you today. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, like I said, we're more than happy to take any questions um, and don't feel like you have to be a speed typer to, to put them in. We can hang out for a few. Um, and if you have to go, we understand that too. The good thing about this is you don't have to get up in front of a crowd and walk out, you just hit leave. But um, I'm going to put, I have my web, my, or my website, my uh, email address there so that you can email me if you do have any other questions. And then also the Friends Administrative Assistant, Elaine, um, if you have any questions about getting the book, getting the masks, memberships, anything like that, she'd be the one to contact and uh, can, can line you up with all of that stuff. And um, yeah, like I said, we, we hope to get some feedback from you as well of, of what other type of programs you'd like to see in the future, whether it has to do with the then and now books or maybe some uh, presenters we've had in the past or topics that we've explored in the past. And uh, we'll do our best to, you know, continue to do this type of public engagement and especially with an interest that we got today. So I know we have this poll that Michaela has generously put together for us so that you can give some feedback to us even at this program. Um, do we have any questions there, Michaela? We do. Yeah. Um, first of all, we have some, uh, wonderful. Hi, guys. I'm back. <laughs> um, thank you all so much for joining us. We've got some great compliments coming in as well as questions. Um, but one of the questions um, was, how long did it take to make the book? Forever. Oh, my. <laughs> yes. Well, the, the first edition uh, took probably four years to do. 
Yeah. Uh, this one came together a little more quickly because one, we more or less knew what we were doing, and two, we had the had the original book to work from. So, yeah. but it, what, what was at least two year at least two years, right? I had you running around and there yeah, were stories that will get told and retold over the years about the doing, but it took about two years. Yeah, and and it it, it kind of does sound like a long time, but um, like I said, Jim was really good, even. And we actually had some other help too, you know, like with Jan Sweeney doing review of the of the content of the book as well. So there's a lot of work put into that. Uh, my focus was more on the the imagery itself, um, you know. And so the the problem that we hit is the the one year that we decided to really pull the trigger on it and and kickstart it and get going, it was already late in the summer, and so we could only do so many summer shots. Uh, and then the weather started going bad and all of a sudden you'd be lining up these images and, you know, I had a perfect one of the Dunraven cottage, but all, you know, it was already fall by then and all the grass was yellow and compared to the original one, I just didn't think it was a true representation of it. And so, so we had to wait for that winter. The good thing about it though, was it gave us a chance to do a couple of winter sites. So we went up and reshot Hidden Valley, you know, instead of doing it in the summer, we got it in its prime in the winter, which is good. Um, and so then we, and then we went into the next summer um, to go ahead and try to capture some of those images again. And then it takes quite a while to get the design down and do final edits and everything else and uh, kind of call out some of the sites because it was getting pretty hefty. So it took a little while, but I really enjoyed it. Um, it was a ton of fun hanging out with Jim and Mick. Um, I definitely did a lot of running around more in the park than in the SS Park region. Um, but it was nice. It, it was definitely nice um, knowing where some of the sites were and then having to find some of the other sites because that's that's always exciting to to try to have to find these and um, you know it's more of a challenge. And then there are a few times too where Jim would tell me something was right around the corner and I'd go around the corner for 20 minutes and it was not around the corner. And as soon as I'd get back to the car, he'd say, it wasn't there, was it? And, no, no, it wasn't. And he'd say, that's because it's around the next corner. <laughs> just over the hill, beyond the hill. <laughs> yeah, just keep chasing the horizon. The, the real the real irony is, and you you alluded to it earlier. We did we had to cut off the sites. We could probably have done another thirty or forty without any problems. The museum has a tremendous collection of photographs. Uh, I think we hit the high the high places, but we could have exp uh, in many of the sites we could have included two or three photographs of the same site and then retaken them. I think that would have been interesting. But in the interest of getting the book done. And then not overloading the designer, we just had to call it quits. Yeah, so there might be another project in the making. I was just going to say, we have another question. When will the next edition be out? And I think Jim is already pitching it. <laughs> yeah, Mick has been pitching now for a while that he wants to do a whole book of just panoramas because he is enthralled with them. Um, so that that's a possibility. Um, I think we should just do site favorites. I'll just pick mine, just be extremely biased and pick a site, and then we'll just find all the photos we have for it and just focus on my favorites, but they might not be everybody else's favorites. Well, what's interesting is that as much as we know about Estes Park's history, there's still a lot to learn and a lot yeah. to discover. And that's part of the fun of doing books like this and doing research. And I'm sure it's part of the fun of being a part of, the, of a wonderful museum and you've got a great staff and you're doing a great job. And I, I know all of us appreciate what you're doing. Uh, during this time of pandemic when everything is just difficult to get accomplished. So thanks for cheers, that. Cheers to you guys. Well, I do have to thank my staff too, because they're when I'm out going shooting these photos, they're the ones that are making the museum run. So I appreciate their efforts too. <laughs> um, all right. So one last question. Which was the hardest photo to get? Speaking of running around and taking photos. Uh, for today's set or throughout the book? Um, let's say for today's set, just from the ones we saw today. Oh, today's. I, I was going to say, if Mick was here, he'd probably tell you the one from Mount Olympus was the most difficult, but, yeah. but that's, that's for another, another, day, another day. Yeah, we'll include today's, that. In. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Well, if you had to say, like, the most frustrating one to match up, it was the one with F.O. Stanley leading yeah. the energy range. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, was just, that. I just couldn't get it right. And it was the other reason why it was annoying, and I did have permission, 
but every time I had to go out and reshoot it, I, every time I, well, to get that angle, you had to jump a little fence. So the four times I went out there, each time I had to jump the fence, look out for the cows, you know, and all of that fun stuff. So it just, it's just frustrating because every time I thought I got it and then I'd get back to my desk and be like, I don't have it. Good thing it's only a five minute drive. <laughs> well, thank um, you. Those rocks were there. Yeah. Yeah, it could have been worse. Um, I'm trying to think if any of the other ones were extremely difficult. Well, the, the Estes Evans Dunraven Ranch caused its own problems because the road, uh, Fish Creek Road has been raised. That, that, that was a problem until we realized we were dealing with a, with a road which was not, not the original yeah. road. Yeah, that's true. And then I'd say one of the more dangerous ones was probably um, the one when we were looking at Beaver Points. Oh, or, yes. when, or when we were looking at the intersection of Mall Road and um, and 36, because you have to realize you're using all of your uh, mental capacity to match this up to a photo that you're staring at printed out, and you're standing in the middle of a road. And so you're really putting your trust into Jim, who's not taking the photo, to <laughs> scream out to you in enough time if a car is coming or not. Um, so those ones, anyone you got to get in the road for is nerve wracking. Yeah, and you have to worry about whether I'm looking at the next list and, on the list and saying, take it and let's get going. So Yeah, that's true, too. Um, <laughs> you think he's looking for cars and he's saying, I think you need to go a little more to the left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Well, if you guys, do you have any, any last bits to add? No, other than thanking you for putting yeah. this together. I mean, this is a brave new world and you're right smack in the middle of it. So thanks. Yeah, I hope. Um, stay tuned. We'll have some more Zoom programs coming at you. So again, check our website, check our Facebook page um, to stay updated. And hopefully we'll see you all in cyberspace again very soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks Bye. for joining us. Bye, guys. Bye.